Namo myoho renge kyo. Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here. I hope that you're healthy and well and uh, keeping your practice strong. So I haven't done one of these in a long time. Actually, this will probably be the first one I actually for format as uh, a Q&A. And I think uh, I'm getting more and more questions. Uh, we have new people coming onto the channel, uh, new people contacting me by email at uh, tlksylvain at gmail.com um, and people who are commenting on videos um, and a lot of the same questions keep coming up in different forms and uh, I thought well you know it, it's not that I want to answer the same questions over and over again uh, but there are some subjects that keep bubbling to the surface and that's all great, so don't think I'm admonishing anyone here. But I saw the need, perhaps, to have uh, an occasional Q&A uh, to kind of, kind of a state of things. Uh, or I don't know. I don't know how this is going to play out. But um, there's one question in particular. I sh I say one question, but it's really many questions all. Um, wrapped together and uh, I don't think sometimes when we ask questions of things we don't understand uh, that the question we're asking actually requires foundational questions answered on even definition of terms and so one question it can actually be 10 um, and so this happens a lot when we uh, start to discuss uh, sectarian ideas that have floated into uh, whatever school of thought that we are currently investigating, whether it be Buddhism or anything else. Um, and so there's an opportunity here for a lot of learning, a lot of teaching, uh, self-teaching, and a lot of valuable foundational understanding to help us un get the meaning of Buddhist Dharma uh, teaching and practice and uh, deep, deep insights to really launch our profound insights about what is Buddhism, how are we practicing it, why are we practicing it, how does it work, why does it work, all of these questions, right? Um, and uh, I will preface this with two things I want you both to know. Um, all, all of you, uh, both. I mean, me and all of you. That's a weird both in my mind. <laughs> uh, but we're all one, right? So anyway, uh, um, there are organizations, and I'm just going to restrict my conversation to Buddhism here. Uh, but this, a lot of these statements I'm going to make apply to just all sorts of things in life. And it, and I have to say that because Buddhism isn't about anything else. Okay, Buddhism is about this life and how to live it the most fully that is possible. And having said that, listening to my own words, it should be obvious that that means you. It doesn't mean... How does Betty practice? How does John practice? How does Sylvain practice? I mean, we share our experience and our learning with one another in order to launch our personal development in our Buddhist practice because it is personal. It is individual. It is your practice. I can't say this often enough. Nobody can hand you Buddha. Nobody can tell you how to um, find your own path to Buddha. Only you can do that. And ipso facto, nobody can hold it back from you. Nobody can say, this is, this is the, the right one, right? This is such a, we live in a world today and, and capitalism is an outgrowth of this, but it's, it's, it's so many things. It goes beyond socioeconomic systems. They're just uh, indicators 
of the way samsara is. We all want to think we have the best one. Mine is better than yours, or even yours is better than theirs. We're so obsessed with identifying and then hanging on to clinging, what Buddha called craving, right? We want our craving. Understand craving isn't like when you want ice cream. Craving is when you want what you want constant. We want to make things permanent. We want to make things identifiable and stationary. You are mine forever. This is my desk forever. Right? It's implicit in every thought we have as a human being that whatever we identify is what we identify forever. And this is one of the first fundamental premises of Buddhism. If you want to ask yourself how it changes your thinking, is that no thing, nothing, no thing, emotion, place, noun, pronoun, nothing is static. Everything is always in the process of becoming and decaying. This is critical for you to understand because it applies to every atom in your body and brain. Every atom of the chair I'm sitting in. One day, this chair will cease to exist. Because existing is a process. It's not a stasis. Nothing from atomic to the biggest boulder you can imagine is permanent. Everything is in a constant state of flux. Everything. Even your thoughts. So, I say all of this because um, when I get questions about sectarian, not just sectarian differences, but ideas proposed by certain sects or groups or organizations. There's a fundamental problem with that question. So I want to ask you a question now. I want you to hear me out. I know I can be long-winded, but this is a very, very important idea that you need to grasp in all things. So please, please, if something I say makes you recoil or, or even angers you, please, please, I beseech you, stick with me for a little bit. Let me talk it through. Because the, and many of you know I'm also an artist, so I talk about this in art as well. If something confronts you in some way, that means karmically that there's something there. There's something there. Usually when something disturbs us deeply, it's because there's something there we're not wanting to look at. We're not wanting to question. And guess what? That's a huge clue. Because if you're not wanting to question it, that means that your, your craving, your attachment, your adherence is so inculcated by you that it shakes the very fabric of what you think is absolute or necessary for you to just go on. You don't think about it at that level you just <clears throat> you come up against it when you come up against something i'm not saying you need to immediately turn that around in your head and embrace it give it time investigate it for yourself 
You don't have to take anyone's word for anything. But if that word launches you into some kind of emotional reaction, then you need for yourself to question it. Not why does that bother me. Remember why is a big trap linguistically. But how is it that that creates this immediate reaction in me? What is it that I think I'm hearing or seeing or whatever? Please, please be willing to question yourself. That's a absolute fundamental of Buddhist practice. Buddhist it, this 84,000 teachings of Buddha are all about this fundamental thing. Question what you think. Right? Buddhism is about attitude and intent. And attitude and intent come from perception. You can't have an attitude or an intent without first perceiving something to have an attitude about or an intent toward. Buddhism is about that perception and shifting it to what? Our Buddha-ness, our Buddha nature. So please, I want to ask all of you a question. And, and it may sound trivial, it may sound stupid, but I want you to be super honest about, with yourself right now. Because you may, you know, our brains are really rapid fire. <laughs> so when I ask this question, you might have two, three, 30 different little voices go, blah, 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 and all and make your eyes shift a little bit. Because I doubt the answer will be absolutely immediate. Even if it comes out of your mouth almost immediately, I guarantee you'll have at least five shades of thoughts about this. So here's the question. Whose Buddhism do you practice? <laughs> Man, I, I could start fights here. <laughs> but I don't want to. I want to burst that damn pimple. See, something that you need to realize, and I talk about it all the time in terms of the past, Nietzschean talks about it all the time, about how sectarian differences uh, inculcate into the cultures over hundreds of years. But also, in our modern times, in far shorter um, uh, time spans, we get swayed constantly as humans influence remember influence 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 we influence ourselves our environment influences because that's ourselves too we influence our environment this is a constant soup of interactions and influences that's why it's so important to have something to focus with on our myoho renge kyo on our buddhaness right so who's who's buddhism do you practice now, um, those who are familiar with me and the way that I share my knowledge, I don't want to, I don't like the word teach because I think that's something that we do to ourselves. We teach ourselves. And if there's a goal in Buddhism, I could easily say that it is for our Buddha-ness to teach our humanness. That's how circular this practice is. So if you know that about me, those uh, there may be those amongst you who would say, "Oh, I know, Sifu, the the person, the the Buddhism I practice is mine." Sure, great answer. I think you're absolutely right. But for the purposes of discussion, entering that danger zone now is yes. You practice your Buddhism because it's your path to your Buddha nature. Got it. But let me ask it a different way then. Whose framework of that practice are you using, utilizing, 
What scholarship, in other words, do you follow? Now, you may be having a lot of different voices in your head, even to the point where, well, I started there, and I went there, and then I went there, and now I'm here, and right? Okay. Nietzsche talks about this all the time, the, the errors in the eight schools of his day, right? Between Nembutsu, practice, true word, uh, Zen, and uh, uh, flower garland, and blah, 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 right? But when we talk about that, and when Nietzsche talks about that, and we read about that, we tend to think this is like a past thing, that that doesn't apply to us. Holy crap. Today, we've got Nietzsche and Shoshu, Nietzsche and Shu, SGI, NSA, uh, Independent This. It's, it's just, there's so many sects or schools of thought about Buddhism today. And what do we want to do as human beings? Who's right? If they're right, then they must all be wrong, right? Now, again, I, I don't want to turn any of you off, but we're in the midst of the latter day of the law. And Shakyamuni himself, the founder, the guy who created this whole idea, and methodology to attain what he had attained, Buddhahood, right? Forget Tendai, Nietzsche, uh, all, uh, all this scholarship. Shakyamuni, the founder, you can't get rid of him without getting rid of Buddhism. It's his. And I say it with all that passion because over and over again, Nietzsche points out how many great teachers or people who are responsible for the education of the people would just walk away from that, either for their own ego or for the ego of, well, their own ego in the personage of who they call their teacher and edifying them in, in, in place of or as superior to Shakyamuni. It's insane how easily that happens in history, in all things. And you've heard me talk about the way it happens in the modern world with great scholarship, academic, brilliant minds who go and study these ancient writings and create translations for us into English or French or any Western language. But they can't help but bring their cultural understanding to bear. In fact, you've heard me say this before, there's a great deal of westernization of language to filter these Buddhist ideas through, these ancient Asian ideas through, for what is the perceived Western mind. And along with that comes Western spiritual religious rhetoric like faith and praying and um, uh, and and even Hindu malarkey about reincarnation and uh, it and, and our fascination oh my goodness what is eternal what does eternity mean to the Western mind and the Asian mind for that matter with this, in Asia, this, this ancient history of flail uh, ancestry and this, this obsession with respecting ancestors for generations back and future, right? In the West, not so much that, but still a fascination with self, that identified self as being somehow a, a, a special bag of eternal like soul, oh my God, the soul. That is such a uh, an insipid concept. Now, I know I pissed off a lot of you right now. But I, please, if you're still here, I encourage you, please hear me out. It 
if the people or the organization, first of all, ugh, there's so many things I want to say right now. I, and I've said this, I have documents on my website, threefoldlotus.com, about these sectarian things, SGI in particular, but, but also all of sectarianism today. They're all vying for the same political, we're number one, which has nothing to do with Buddhism. Organizations exist for the organization. We've seen this for thousands of years. And I repeat myself constantly, but please know that it's happening today. Organizations' primary concern is the survival of the organization. How do they survive? Through numbers, money. Their wealth is their stamina, is their power. Can there be anything more authoritarian? So naturally, if they want to keep that money flowing, they need to keep that membership. They need to keep those pants, pockets, and wallets in place. And so how do you do that? Well, you make the wallets that you have believe that they are different than all the other wallets and that theirs is most special. That's authoritarianism. That is not Buddhism. Nichiren inscribed one mandala to be universal. He inscribed many during his lifetime, but in his later life, he inscribed a universal mandala for all of us into the future as a focal point to our Gohanzen, our Buddha nature, our Buddha wisdom, that whole complex of knowing, clarity, inculcating into our daily life, that whole mix of stuff. Our Buddha hood is a hood because it's a, it's a agglomerate of things. It's our mental focus. It's our mental clarity, perception, and it's in our invocation of that mind that we clarify our perceptions in order to live it, be it. And whose teaching is that? And I'll keep coming back to that because I'm going to hammer on it. Guess what? It's not Nietzsche's. <gasps> what? What are you saying? Nichiren is our great, most recent scholar, Bodhisattva, of Shakyamuni's teaching. That is the only teaching we practice. And we practice it in our own individual ways, our Buddha practice. We don't practice Nichiren Buddhism. We don't practice any... Shoshu Buddhism, Shu Buddhism, Bapalupap Buddhism, Ikedaism. We don't practice those things. Those are organizations. Those are propaganda. That's not what we practice. If that's in your thinking anywhere, you need to correct it immediately. Nietzsche would be pulling his hair out right now. Nietzsche himself constantly talks about himself being a normal, humble, not too bright man. He's no deity. There are no deities in Buddhism. What he is, is almost an affliction by his own words of a clear thinking, truths to power speaking Buddhist of Shakyamuni. This is why Nichiren is a Bodhisattva, often uh, uh, talked about as, a, as an embodiment, not incarnation, an embodiment of Bodhisattva superior practices spoken about in the Lotus Sutra, 
whose teaching is Shakyamuni's. Nietzsche was incredibly clear about this. He repeats it constantly. So, whose practice is this? Whose Buddhism do you practice? Back to Gohonzon, back to Mandala. Only Nichiren inscribed this Mandala. Any organization or group that claims to have their own that's better is lying to you and they are not practicing Shakyamuni's Buddhism. They're also not practicing Nichiren's doctrine of the Lotus Sutra of Shakyamuni's Buddhism. Please hear me when I say this. The, the construct of this crazy fanatical um, adherence to the idea of lineage is an insipid propaganda to lead you away from Shakyamuni Buddha. And even Nietzschean scholarship, ours is better because it came through some handing down. They're human words. They're not Nietzschean's mandala. They're so egotistical about it, they have to sign it themselves. I don't want to meditate and focus on your, your, what? Your name, the date that you recreated what's already been created. I don't want that crap. Get out of the way. I want to practice Shakyamuni's Buddhism and I want to use the tool that Nichiren's advent was for clearly without your baloney in the way. I don't need you to do this. This is my Buddhism and I practice it the way Shakyamuni taught it and Nichiren opened it up and gave me this tool for Be very, 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 very critical of anyone who tells you that their Buddhism is better. There is only one Buddhism. That is the Buddhism taught by the one who created it. Shakyamuni. And there's only one mandala of Gohonzon. And that is the one Nichiren inscribed. No one else. These fake arguments about ours is better and this is better. And we're going back to a purer form. And You know what? That all sounds like the same stupidity that Nichiren talks about all the time. About the true word schools, Zen, Nembutsu, all of these others. Nichiren just eviscerates their stupidity. And yet... Look at how many hundreds and thousands of people that they control for their organizations. Stop it. There's varying degrees of arrogance and ego in these different groups and sects. Some less so. Some legitimately try to keep things clear and defer to Nichiren and Shakyamuni all the time. And I think that's wonderful. I, I give them kudos for keeping that going. It's not easy. It's not easy to do these videos on, on YouTube. It's an, an unimaginable, unimaginably different situation than a hundred years ago, let alone a thousand, right? It's so easy to be swayed. Please don't be swayed. 
keep coming back to those same questions. Whose Buddhism do you practice? Who's the authority? Yeah, because we're human beings, samsara is very authoritarianly uh, not designed, but um, structured. You know, the way we identify things and then cling to those identifications, that's a very authoritarian, or it suits authoritarian kind of thinking. I'd rather you just told me what to do. I don't want to think about it. And I'm sitting here telling you, flip that on its head. We tell one another what we're doing so that collectively we can better understand what it is that I'm doing, you're doing, she's doing, right? That's a sangha. I don't need some group to give me a certificate to say, you, you now know this much. <laughs> Who are you to tell me how much I know about anything? I may get an epiphany in the next 10 seconds that surpasses anything I've learned in the past. Should I get a certificate for that? Or is my enlightenment enough? Right? I guess since I ca I'm calling this a Q&A, I guess I finally should get to a couple of questions that I've gotten. Um, let's see how they pertain to what I'm talking about today. Okay, uh, Dimitri asked several questions here. I'm going to attempt to answer one. The Eternal Buddha, we, we read about that. We, again, remember we're reading translations. So what is an Eternal Buddha? Right? Let's have this discussion. What's an eternal Buddha? Is there an eternal Buddha? It's in the language, isn't it? What does eternity mean? Okay, so I want to break this down real simply, and I'm going to try to avoid having an hour-long conversation before I get to the point. Here's the point. Eternity is a statement we samsaric beings use to identify a time span that we abstract, that we can't possibly understand. Now, I've done videos on time. And you can go watch those. But I'm going to say it right here and now. Eternity is this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment, this moment. And it's every moment that's come before and will ever exist. Because it's two things. It's a finger pointing at a process. A process that has no end points. That process is happening now. It's happening now. It's happening now. Moment to moment to moment to moment. This process is ongoing. Okay? Just like a metronome. The process is happening. Okay? When did the metronome start? We don't know. We can't possibly know. When does it end? Now, 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 now. It ends, it ends, it starts, it ends, it starts, it ends, it starts. Isn't that an interesting idea about time? This is Buddhist time. Buddhist time is the beginning and end of every single moment and the beginning and end of this rhythm of every single moment. Whew. This is birth and death. Birth and death and birth and death and birth and death, birth and death, birth and death, birth and death. And it is eternal. All right. Once you grasp that, understand that the term Buddha is not a singular thing. And it is a singular thing. How can I say that? Because... Buddha is now, now, not now, now, no, 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 no. Buddha is this process clearly perceived. Buddha is you when you're clear minded, when your perception is clear, you are Buddha. When your perception is not clear, you are not Buddha. But Buddha 
is always there. No, 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 not now, no, 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 no. Buddha, 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 Buddha. That's eternal. The process is eternal. Because it has no time. We put time to it because this is samsara. Buddha is not Shakyamuni. Shakyamuni attained Buddha. Please understand, Buddha is this state of mind, state of perception, state of knowing, state of being. It can only occur in this samsaric understanding of time, which is without time or eternal. Again, any group or school that wants to appropriate that thinking and perverse it into being their particular saint or their particular person, they're tricking you. They're lying to you. The eternal Buddha is the one that you awaken when you attain clarity. It's the one you invoke when you chant Myoho Renge Kyo. Myoho Renge Kyo is the invocation of your Buddha nature. Your Buddha nature, that clarity, is something we all have. It is our paths that differ. Our Buddha wisdom comes from accessing and invoking that Buddha perception, that Buddha mind be it through our own samsaric understanding. But we all attain that same clarity. Once you're clear, you're clear. What are you clear of? Your own karma. Your own filters. Nobody can tell you what those are. Only you can go through them. But once you're clear, you're clear. Buddha. It's part of the process. Yeah, I know. Some sects want to say Nichiren is the eternal Buddha. <laughs> Nichiren would never say that. But Nichiren would be the first to tell you that he practices Shakyamuni's methodology for attaining that enlightenment right now. Buddha. And he can live every moment of the day as I'm quoting him. In Myoho Renge Kyo. What does that mean? He understands. He's seen with clarity. Perceived. Buddha. He's never said. I am Buddha. Nor did Shakyamuni. Although he used that device. In his storytelling. To attain the attention. Of the people of his day. But we're not in that former day of the law. That's not applicable to the way we think our capacity. This is the latter day of the law. Shakyamuni went out of his way to talk about this and clear, clarify that there are the right times and, right, and different capacities of people and they have to be taught in a different way or their needs are different, their understanding are different. And so you need to apply to the people of the day our own individual, what is it? Um, innumerable paths in order for us all to do what? To attain this, this Buddha that's always there. Eternal. It's not a person. I don't know how more, more, much more simply I could put it. The point here though isn't that you don't understand me when I say that. It's that you're constantly barraged by those that would have you believe otherwise. And they create doubt in you. This is the most heinous thing happening today in these sects and groups. Is they're breaking your confidence in a very simple, straightforward teaching. 
Shakyamuni's teaching, Nichiren's tool to help you to practice that clear tool. Myoho Renge Kyo, he wrote a whole sermon on it. He didn't write it, he spoke it. But the 28 chapters and the opening and closing of the Lotus Sutra are this constant discussion of Myoho Renge Kyo. And Nichiren points to it and goes, there it is. Just do that. That's all you need to do. That's what works for us now. <sighs> yeah, when, when uh, Nichiren Shu says Shakyamuni Buddha uh, is uh, of the Juryo chapter is uh, the eternal Buddha, I'm not sure if they use those words. But even if they did, do you understand what that means? You have to deconstruct the language a little bit here. Jujuro chapter is what? The lifespan of the Tathagata. The lifespan of the Tathagata. My God, listen to the title. The Tathagata is the living expression of Buddha-ness. It's not Shakyamuni. It's this eternal Buddha that you and I are both attaining. That's the Tathagata. And that whole chapter is dedicated to breaking the minds of these students of his, and I call us all students, because we're students of the Shakyamuni's Buddhism and Nichiren's uh, uh, um, elucidation of the method of the Lotus Sutra, Myoho Renge Kyo. It's so clear to me. If you remove yourself from the politics of the organizations, it becomes so clear. Read a few sutras. Don't be locked into just one organization. Just read this book, otherwise, ah! What, how could that be? If there are 84,000 teachings and you can only let me read one book, aren't you running counter to the whole purpose of the teaching? Well, I, these contradictions are so obvious. We live in authoritarian times. People would rather be told what to do and accept it without question rather than research for themselves. This is the world we live in. So what was I saying? The Juryo chapter. That was Shakyamuni's, that chapter is about, listen people, I, Shakyamuni, am a man. I attained this thing we call Buddha. I'm calling it Buddha. But that is not me. Buddha is not a man. Buddha is not me, Shakyamuni. It is something I have achieved. And my entire breadth of teachings, my entire life long teachings, traveling and teaching this enlightenment thing, is to enable you to do exactly as I've done. Attain Buddha. That's what the whole chapter is about. I mean... <laughs> Alright, what's next? Uh, studies on the Lotus Sutra that aren't on the SGS case of Toma. Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is the eternal Buddha. Well, that's not wrong. But, again, the language bothers me. Because how many of you just heard me say, Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is the eternal Buddha? Oh, now I know where to find it. <laughs> Namu Myoho Renge Kyo is your tool to attain what is an eternal process of Buddhahood. 
That's a different way of saying that. But we must be clear, if we're to understand what we're saying and what we're doing in our practice, we must be clear. Language is tricky, but we must try to nail down what it is we're actually saying. And if we don't know them, damn it, study, research. SGI leaders, because he proposes some studies. Uh, yeah, what do you think about the question? Okay, uh, that's from Dimitri. Now, Wayne says, the study materials you provide reference to, uh, make reference to Daigo Hansen. Oh, God, here we go again. I wonder how it might relate to this concept. So he was uh, t uh, commenting on a um, video that I did on uh, Shijo Kingo, asking for advice from Nitrin on uh, consecrating an image of Shakyamuni Buddha. Um, undoubtedly to help him focus, help him practice. You can see in Nitrin's time this desperate human desire for some kind of a, um, a, uh, a tangible object, a focal point to, to, to force one's samsaric mind to stay focused on enlightenment. On, on Buddhahood, on, right? And so the way it used to be done was by carefully constructing a portrait of Shakyamuni Buddha or a sculpture and creating an altar, creating some kind of a samsaric focal point. So, I mean, Nichiren's time was full of signs that said, Nichiren, find a universal object, something to help our our feeble human attention span of avarice and, and attachment to, to trick itself, to trick itself into its enlightenment, right? This is the whole concept of earthly desires are enlightenment. Use this mandala, this script of the Lotus Sutra and its various concepts as a, as a, a, a focal point of Shakyamuni's teachings of Buddha, the central component of invoking that relationship with Buddha, I'm determined to realize my enlightenment. But that's not it. That's not Buddha. Nietzsche knew this. Nietzsche knew he was knew he was making a device. The most ultimate, supreme, clear device, devoid of any other influence that he could muster, that encapsulated not only the Lotus Sutra, but everything the Lotus Sutra was built on, all of Shakyamuni's teachings. And by saying it aloud keeping a rhythm, making sure we say it correctly, enunciate it correctly, repeat it, listen to it, feel it, breathe it, see it, listen to it. Our entire bodies, this is why, you know, you can chant quietly to yourself, nothing wrong with that. But the practice calls for invoking. Invocations are strong. So we use this mandala of Gohanzan, which is our realization in samsara of our buddhaness that's what gohanzans is this is a representation of our mental process our buddha wisdom opening up this perceptive door of our buddha mind and so with it we can focus our visual attention our oral attention our sound all our senses, all our consciousnesses. And if you don't know what I mean by that, research the nine consciousnesses. I have documents on threefoldlotus.com, all free, download them, study them. I have videos about it, right? In the Western world, we talk a lot about the conscious, the unconscious. Sometimes there's another strata in there. But in Buddhism, there are nine consciousnesses. And we're trying to awaken the most 
fundamental, the Buddha consciousness, right? So, what does Dai Gohansen have anything to do with that discussion? That is another manipulation and a tool of a sect that wants you to believe ours is the best. Ours is, you know, there are a lot of great researchers and academics who've proven that that was a manufactured thing, that it didn't appear till 300 years after the establishment of one of the disciples of schools. It just showed up one day. There's, if you want to study without being curtailed by organizational constraints, if you really want to study, as Shakyamuni said, all of Buddhist and non-Buddhist scholarship, scholarship, he didn't talk about Hardy Boys novels, he talked about the scholarship of understanding the way our mind works in this existence. Then you must go to a proper university, go to a, a proper website, not just a Looney Tunes website, but an academically accredited website. Go and look at the history of these different organizations and you will find quite a mire of questionable things because fundamentally what you end up coming away with is everybody's fighting for dominance so they can get political favors, uh, organizational favors, money, power. It ceases to be about the Dharma, which is all you and I are trying to do. We want to support our practice, right? All right, Wayne, I hope that helps you there. Sultan asked, something said in aging, oh yeah, I said something in a video about uh, uh, the relationship between uh, Buddhism and uh, ruling class governance. Um, yeah, I mean, ever since civilization stopped moving around and became uh, settled and started to create organized societies, uh, there's always been the problem of how do we get everyone to benefit and not steal from each other and somehow have a, a level of equanimity in our society so that everyone can benefit, nobody gets left behind, and everyone can express themselves to without restriction and yet without taking away from anyone else, right? This is the problem of governance. And the tool of governance for great many thousands of years of human existence was given to a special person, a special family that was somehow um, imbued with godlike properties so that nobody would question their authority. You hear that word a lot, authoritarianism? In some societies, that was just the, the most badass guy. You just, everybody just did what Yorkin said because Yorkin would kick your butt if you didn't do as he requested. That's a very, um, how shall I say, <laughs> rude way of govern governance. R might is right. We still see it today. It's in all empire building. From Rome to the United States, France, the conquistadors, the Aztecs, the Mayans, they went the way of uh, being exterminated by those might is right kind of. Right? We have a rich history, us humans, of going to the basest possible tools to achieve some kind of compliance, governance. It's very rare when you find a society that builds its governance around everybody's happiness, like Bhutan. It's very, very rare. Interestingly enough, Bhutan does it around the ideas of Buddhism. You might want to look that up. Um, but I bring it up when I speak about Gosho, especially 
with Nietzsche because he was living in the age of uh, the samurai, the shogunate. And the shogunate was immediately following a time of emperors, emperors like kings, like pharaohs, imbued with this superior enlightenment of the gods. And so people would, but they had to enforce that opinion with warriors, with some kind of an enforcement force, right? So not only am I right because I'm godlike, but if you challenge me, I will strike you down like a freaking god, right? Be very, very afraid. And what does that sound like? That is the domain of religion, developing entire, entire belief systems that everyone would follow. This was the law. There wasn't always a court system. That's relatively recent human history. The court system in its rudimentary forms, read Michel Foucault about this, crime uh, punishment and uh, jailing and organizations of that nature, uh, punishment um, but there's a, a law phase. Um, that's a much more recent development, right? Uh, the idea at, in its earliest form was simply that uh, there were edicts put out by the godlike emperor or king, and they were carried out by a force. Whether you call them knights or you call them samurai, or you call them thugs, in the case of uh, mobs, or, or what do you call it, organized crime, enforcers, they're all the same thing. And in Asia, in Japan, certainly in Nietzsche's day, that influence, uh, that, that, um, that structure of society that the ruler would sanction and abide by that he used as a social structure umbrella on the whole country to justify, number one, his superior enlightenment or condition and which he would then uh, guide his enforcers to make sure it was enacted was Buddhism. And in order to have that kind of power, different schools of Buddhism would compete for the leader's attentions in order to become the sanctioned school. You have to understand, you had educated people and you had serfs, people who knew hardly anything, could hardly, hardly, if at all, read or write. So the whole information of society was guided by these intellectuals who were really responsible for the psychology and the knowledge of the entire society. So they were very much, you know, integrated with the leading leadership of countries, the ruling class. And the ruling class, in its turn, would claim first superiority of these teachings, and second, that uh, it justified their actions, their edicts, their wants, their desires. And in the samurai time, um, that idea of a deified leader had broken down, and the samurai class, the enforcers, found themselves to be much more worthy of running the country. They, the idea of these uh, deified leaders uh, didn't appeal to them anymore because some of them were pretty stupid. So the shogunate considered themselves smarter, so they revolted and, and, and changed Japan into a shogunate. So now the whole society was ruled by enforcers, and these enforcers had as their tool of, of justification and, and uh, implic or, uh, um, social structure, uh, the Buddhist schools, right? So when I said uh, instrument of governance, um, 
is this a guide for correct thinking? So is that including uh, Mahayana tradition of Buddhism? Is there concept foremost spiritual leader like rebirth as a Dalai Lama? So Sultan's kind of going all over the place here. Um, but um, no, Buddhism isn't meant to be a system of governance. Uh, of uh, of governance in a in the sense of a political um, uh, arm of society. P Buddhism, if you want to think of it as governance, is governance of one's own actions. And if all of us were practicing correctly Shakyamuni's Buddhism, then the whole of the country would be the Sangha. And although we are all various in different stages of our own paths, all of us would have a common goal of enlightenment. And this would begin to look like something you've heard from different sects as Kozen Rufu. Because if we're many in body and one in mind, the, the, the conflicts are imbe embedded in an idea of reasoning and Sangha in order to share and enlighten everyone. So conflicts become a tool of learning rather than a tool of power and conquering. And to the extent that this is a governing, yes, absolutely. Buddhism is structured for this kind of governance, governance of oneself. Aristotle said the same thing. Good government starts with the individual. Then it extends to siblings, households, community, so on. This is where governance begins with the individual. That's Aristotle. And Shakyamuni is saying the same thing earlier. But we tend to think of governments because of authoritarianism as something coming on down. Right? This is the history of man. But no, Buddhism is definitely not that. Although it has appropriated it. And this is why we have head, head monks or priests who call themselves the, the most, the closest, just like in Western religions, right? We have this hierarchy in Islam, in, in, uh, in Christianity, in, what, you name it. There's always somebody who's closest to the source. Do you see why Shakyamuni was such a revolutionary? Because you know who's closest to the source? You! There is no more democratic thought in the world than that. Shakyamuni kept telling you, and this is the lifespan chapter again. The ultimate authority in your life is you. Stop looking elsewhere. That's Buddhism. As far as this Dalai Lama rebirth thing, that's Hinduism. That has nothing to do with Buddhism. There is no bag of Sylvain. I'm not going to go somewhere and come back as a duck. I just, come on, be reasonable. That's just, that's, that's so beyond silly that there are words I want to use, but I don't want to be that insulting. But it is insulting to me as a Buddhist to be asked to consider whether a lineage in Buddhism is upheld by this kind of reincarnate thing. That's the same as having an emperor, emperor or a pharaoh. No, Buddhism, Buddhism, you're, you're the deity. If you need to use that word, you make your life what it is. And if you want it to be glorious and open and, and wonderful and, and clear, only you can do that. Nobody can do it for you or take it away. It's all on you. Buddhism is an incredibly individual practice. That's where it derives all its power. This is why people in power are so challenged by it. Because it denies them the authority. All right. Namo myoho renge kyo. Thank you, people. 
for asking, emailing me, asking these questions, because these questions are big. There are lots and lots of other people who have these same thoughts going through their head. And so this is why I don't mind addressing them repeatedly, but I don't want to make a video a day about these same subjects. I'm hoping that these videos will inspire you to do your own research. I'm just glad I can help try to guide and straighten the record, but it comes from over 40 years of study myself. I had these same questions. So thank you for asking. If you, um, this very free form Q and A kind of thing I'm doing here, if this kind of video appeals to you, um, I need to know, I need you to tell me, uh, you know, screw the algorithms and all that. I, I, YouTube demonetized me long ago. Uh, I don't know why. I don't care to know why. That my mission here isn't monetization. My mission here is to grow this sangha of, of modern understanding of what it is to practice Buddhism. Shakyamuni's Buddhism. Your Buddhism. That's all that matters. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Take control of your practice, your Buddhism. If I can help with that, that's glorious to me. My practice of my Buddhism. Thank you for being here. Namo Myoho Renge Kyo. Download this, like all other podcasts, the Buddhahood podcast, um, wherever you get those. And uh, I will see you in the next one. Thank you.